They are one of the richest families in the world. But what lies beneath the veils of the Saudi royal family? A dynasty that rose out of the desert. Ibn Saud is often seen as an Arabian Lawrence of Arabia. But he was better than Lawrence because he actually fought. A family of larger-than-life legends. Faisal is the person who actually propelled the kingdom into the modern era. A family whose wealth was built on black gold. It was this, the great national asset, that Faisal felt that the Saudis should take control of themselves. A family whose excesses make front-page news. The Saudi royal family has been an American ally for over 70 years. But following the tragic events of September 11, 2001, when it was revealed that 15 of the 19 September 11 terrorists were Saudi citizens, questions arose about the future of this precarious alliance, first forged with the Saudi royal family's patriarch. In the deserts of the Arabian Peninsula, rife with warring Bedouin tribes, rose a man who would conquer an empire the size of Western Europe. Handsome and charismatic, Abdul Aziz bin Rahman al Saud, also known as Ibn Saud, might have stepped right out of the Arabian Nights. A man of great physical stature at six foot four inches tall, he towered over most of his Bedouin brothers and was a fierce warrior. Ibn Saud is often seen as an Arabian Lawrence of Arabia. But he was better than Lawrence because he actually fought, and his capture of Riyadh illustrates that. Ibn Saud was 26 when he engaged in the campaign that would define his early career. The battle to recapture the town of Riyadh, which had been lost by his father to the neighboring Rashid tribe a decade earlier. In the pre-dawn hours of January 16, 1902, Ibn Saud and his warriors attacked the Riyadh fort and killed the governor. The garrison quickly surrendered, and Ibn Saud reclaimed his patrimony. But Ibn Saud wanted more than to be the ruler of a small town. He was a visionary who dreamt of uniting the constantly warring Bedouin tribes into one nation. Talking around the campfires, the Bedouin liked to joke about Ibn Saud. They said he's got two swords, a sword of steel, the one with which he conquered, and the sword of flesh, which he used once he'd conquered and would marry the chief daughters of the tribe that he'd conquered and thus bring that tribe physically into the, the union of the Saudi family. Ibn Saud would wed 22 wives and father 45 sons, 35 of whom lived through his lifetime. Ibn Saud's other means of ensuring loyalty were insisting that those he conquered become devout followers of the strict Wahhabi Islamic sect. The, the strictest section of Sunni Islam until the 30s and 40s, they didn't wear silk, they didn't have flowers in their gardens, they would never use perfume, they were Puritan, they were desert people, and they loved him. They had this fierce religious ideology, the willingness on the part of the Ikhwan, the brotherhood as they were called, to die in battle. Almost a willingness, a wish to die in battle uh, because they believed they were fighting a holy war. With the Ikhwan, Ibn Saud was able to conquer an area greater than Western Europe. In the early 20s, Abdullah sees Al Saud uh, was able to really take the ideology of Wahhabism and we might consider today that's the ideology of, of militant Islam and uh, to really make it into a political force in order to pull the tribes of Saudi Arabia together. His successes were great but there would be deep personal losses too. In 1919, at the end of the First World War, Saudi Arabia was struck, as most of the rest of the world was, by the terrible influenza epidemic. They couldn't get um, medical supplies to Riyadh fast enough to save uh, his wife, one of his most dearly beloved wives, um, and also his, his son, Toki, um, who was 
particularly admired by everybody who knew him as a, as a future leader. It was a devastating loss. Yet having survived the epidemic himself, Ibn Saud was even more determined to complete his conquest. In 1926, he took possession of Mecca and Medina, the two holiest sites in Islam. This provided him with an important source of revenue, fees from the annual pilgrimage to Mecca called the Hajj. He charged Muslims to make the Hajj to Mecca. They had to pay a fee to be allowed into Saudi Arabia, and that's how he lived frugally. By 1932, Ibn Saud had conquered the vast territory between the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. He would name it after his family, Saudi Arabia, and proclaim himself king. However, the Great Depression of the early 30s put Ibn Saud's new kingdom in jeopardy. He watched as revenues from the Hajj dwindled. Far fewer Muslims could now afford the pilgrimage to Mecca. In 1933, when Ibn Saud was desperate for money, he was approached by a representative of the Standard Oil Company of California, offering to pay him $170,000 in gold to drill for oil. Ibn Saud actually said to the British ambassador at the time, what do you think, should I take this money? And the British ambassador said, yes, take it, because there's no oil there anyway. They're paying you these stupid Americans money for nothing. He summoned someone, asked him about the oil well that was discovered, was told how much oil it was producing and what the oil was worth, and he asked, are we going to discover more? And the other fellow, smiling, told him they're going to, they're going to discover hundreds more. And he looked at him and said, cap it. There is going to be too much money, and too much money is trouble. And it took a great deal to convince him not to cap the first oil well. But before Ibn Saud even had the chance to enjoy this newfound wealth, World War II broke out, severely curtailing Saudi oil production. Many of the American oil drillers and geologists were called into active service. American oil production takes the national spotlight. Along with news of our fuel oil shortages comes the fresh warning that our known oil reserves will be exhausted in 10 years at the current... The war had dramatically diminished reserves in the U.S., and President Roosevelt recognized the importance of Saudi oil to America's future. As a result, Ibn Saud received loans through the U.S. Lend-Lease Act to see him through the war. On February 14, 1945, the king was invited to meet President Roosevelt aboard the USS Quincy. When Ibn Saud mentioned the severe pains in his arthritic legs, President Roosevelt quickly offered him his extra wheelchair. FDR hoped the king might offer him something in return, support for the proposed new state of Israel. This is something that Ibn Saud, along with all the other Arabs, uh, had opposed strenuously. Roosevelt explained the terrible circumstances of the Holocaust and how badly the Jews had been treated by Germany and needed a homeland of their own. And Ibn Saud looked at Roosevelt straight in the face, apparently, and said, yes, it was a terrible thing. So why wouldn't the Jews be given a bit of Germany for their homeland? Because it wasn't the Palestinians who had ever done any harm to the Jews. The king received a promise from President Roosevelt that he would continue to be consulted on the homeland issue. But President Roosevelt died two months later, and President Truman later supported the UN resolution for the creation of the State of Israel without consulting the king. While there were some who felt, especially the oil people, that the king, the old king, might retaliate by canceling the oil concession, he made it very clear to us that he was not going to do this. And so the question of Israel became an issue on which we in effect agreed to disagree. With the end of World War II, drilling resumed in Saudi Arabia. American firms have opened new fields abroad. Of these, one of the biggest and most important is Saudi Arabia. Beneath its blistering sands lies a near ocean of oil whose potential reserves are estimated at 150 billion barrels. Standard Oil of California joined Texaco and Standard Oil of New Jersey and New York to form Aramco, the Arabian American Oil Company. With more capital for exploration, oil money came pouring into King Ibn Saud's personal treasury. This was a personal license 
to drill oil that Ibn Saud had granted in his lands. It was his money. And to this day, uh, there is a sense in which the House of Saud consider the oil to be their own personal property. The sudden influx of oil revenues means a new role for King Ibn Saud. In time, the vast wealth produced would transform Saudi Arabia from one of the poorest nations in the world into one of the richest. It would also have a dramatic impact on the lives of the royal family. After World War II, millions of dollars began pouring into Ibn Saud's royal purse from the black gold lying beneath the Arabian desert. He had a lot of charm, personality, charisma. Nestor Sander, now 87, was a young paleontologist with Aramco when he met Ibn Saud. They drove into the camp there with this big black Chrysler sedan with these two big Somali slaves on either running board with a rifle and, and, a, and they bred robes and they were very fancy looking. That evening, the king gave a dinner for 40 Aramco employees. I looked at him and, you know, he had this patch over one eye. You never find a picture of him with a patch over his eye. This black patch was on his left eye because in 1923 and 24 he'd had erysipelas and the erysipelas had destroyed the vision in the eye. Ibn Saud had provided a feast fit for a king. He was always very generous and made sure the tribes in his extended family were well taken care of. He gave them money and of course when the oil came he gave them more money. He saw to it that every tribe was happy. He saw to it that they would follow him without question. As well as spending money on the tribes, the king also enjoyed treating himself to the latest inventions, like the telephone. And he could be inventive when he ran into religious opposition. Ibn Saud arranged a special demonstration of how the telephone could work. And he had it call up a distant town. And he said to one religious sheikh, well, why don't you speak on the phone and see what you can hear at the other end? And at the other end, Ibn Saud had stationed another religious sheikh. And so when the religious saw that this work of the devil could, in fact, be used to, to make their own communications easier, they changed their mind. But by the early 50s, the king's health was failing. He had severe arthritis, was blind in one eye, and was scarred from his many battles. Knowing that his health was failing, Ibn Saud made sure his kingdom would stay in the family. In the last years of his life, Ibn Saud relied very strongly on his two eldest surviving sons, Saud and Faisal. But most people who knew the two brothers knew that the second brother, Faisal, was the one who really had it in his head, the one who had the political ability. And so, before he died, Ibn Saud is said to have brought the two brothers together and asked that although one would obviously become king, that was Saud, and the younger one, Faisal, would become crown prince, they should see themselves as a partnership and should work as a team. On November 9, 1953, Ibn Saud died in Faisal's arms at the age of 77. He was laid to rest in a simple, unmarked grave in keeping with Wahhabi tradition, which prohibits elaborate rituals. The simplest of ceremonies for a man they called the Lion of the Desert. He wanted to attain modernity for his people while keeping his society as it was in the earliest days of Islam. This is a tall order. But it's a formula that he perfected and that enabled Saudi Arabia to maintain its puritanical religion and at the same time accept modernity that has come through to this day, I believe. And I think that was amazingly, it showed amazing vision on his part. Yet only a decade later, his son, King Saud, would come dangerously close to destroying everything his father had achieved. Saud was known as a, a mismanager. He was not what we'd call a successful manager by modern standards. Uh, the country ran into huge deficits. Uh, 
Um, he had a reputation for being more interested in the leisurely lifestyle than in the running uh, of, uh, of a country. King Saud turned out to be the most disastrous of the kings. No one has ever been quite able to figure out what he was motivated by uh, other than his own personal pleasure. Saud eventually built 10 palaces and in one year ran up five million dollars in food bills alone. He gave solid gold watches to visitors with his portrait. They became known as Mickey Souths. Even with millions in oil money pouring into the treasury, the lavish lifestyle of the king had put the country in debt. The royal family was upset with his excesses and also with his support for Egypt's president, Gamal Nasser. They were worried about Arab socialism, and they were worried about Nasser's connections with the Soviet Union. The Saudis are deeply religious, consider communism, generally speaking, as atheism. President Eisenhower was concerned as well. To break Saud's infatuation with Nasser, in 1957, he enacted the Eisenhower Doctrine, which promised military and financial aid to any country fighting communist aggression. Eisenhower and Dulles had the idea for a time that Saud, representing the Saudi state, which was receiving more and more oil income, might be a useful counter to Nasser in the Arab world. America's military and economic aid dampened Saud's enthusiasm for Nasser. In 1957, Eisenhower invited Saud to visit the White House. When King Saud arrived in Washington, D.C. with his entourage, they stayed at Blair House. The king's servant was overheard commenting, the U.S. president must be a poor man because he has such an old place for his guests to stay in. If King Saud wasn't everyone's choice of favorite house guest, his young son Mashur had stolen the hearts of Americans. The king had brought his son to receive treatment for polio at Walter Reed Hospital. Mashur was Saud's 24th son, and perhaps the only area where Saud excelled over his father, Ibn Saud, was in procreating. He was to sire 52 sons and 55 daughters. When visiting the United States, King Saud had been gracious and charming. But at home, his behavior was becoming a major embarrassment, and his excessive drinking had taken a toll on his health. He simply was not up to running a country that was rapidly moving from the 7th century into the 20th century. The skills, the sensitivities, the sophistication, the administrative skills, he just didn't possess. He was a rather tragic figure. The family council decided it was time for Crown Prince Faisal to assume the responsibilities of governing and appointed him prime minister. But in 1960, Saud sought to regain his power. The family acceded to his wishes, hoping he would rein in his lifestyle and finally take charge. But after four more years of huge deficits, in 1964, the royal family called upon the religious council, the ulema, to make a final decision as to who should rule. Saud was deposed and sent into exile in Greece. He would die five years later in 1969 at the age of 67. Crown Prince Faisal was named the new ruler of Saudi Arabia. King Faisal, I, I think you could almost call him the idealized king. He was tall. He was very distinguished looking, much more educated and worldly than any of the predecessors. The royal family now put their faith in Faisal to restore the health and wealth of the kingdom. In 1964, the royal family of Saudi Arabia declared their monarch, King Saud, unfit to rule. In his stead, they chose the heir apparent, King Faisal. Personality-wise, they were so different. Intellectually, they were so different. Saud, the last thing one would ever have said about him was that he was an intellectual. That wasn't his interest. Faisal was very well read, paid attention to all kinds of things. He was, he was a very wise, able man.
Faisal had been groomed all his life for the top spot. As a young boy of 14, he was singled out by his father, Ibn Saud, to make a trip to Europe. When he was only 25, his father appointed him foreign minister. He was a very modest, a very humble man. I remember his once saying to me, one should always listen twice as long, twice as much as one talks. In 1945, he was in his late 50s and had left his place to earth extremely willing to fit in mayboy life behind I understand that when he was a young man he was a bit of a libertine at times uh, I can't say how much or just where but that was what the stories were certainly by the time I knew him he was anything but Faisal's first challenge was to save a failing economy he initiated tough reforms, warning princes that they'd have to tighten their belts and lower their expectations. He initiated an ambitious five-year economic plan, building schools, hospitals, and irrigation projects. Faisal, more than any other king in the kingdom, is the person who actually propelled the kingdom into the modern era. And he did it even to the risk of bringing television into Saudi Arabia. There were actual demonstrations against this wicked Western invention that would bring these ghastly soap operas showing the decadence of the West into the Holy Land. King Faisal insisted that this was uh, an innovation which, under control, could actually enhance education and, and pushed it through. Faisal was a tough taskmaster, but he was equally demanding of himself. The man would work 12 to 14 hours a day, receiving petitions, seeing foreign diplomats, meeting with his cabinet. So he was unlike any other uh, Saudi ruler I have known. He was a creature of work. Faisal had already begun initiating reforms when he was the prime minister under King Saud, including eliminating slavery in 1962 when pressured by President Kennedy. President Kennedy supposedly said to Faisal, Your Majesty, you're going to deny this, but there are slaves in your country, and I want them freed. And they were freed as a result of this meeting. He was the cleverest king they ever had. And in some ways, revolutionary. And I'll give you an example. Girls' schools didn't exist until Faisal became king. And when he opened the first one, there were a lot of protests from the ulamas and everybody else. They wanted to tear it down, and he stood his ground and got away with it. Faisal understood the need for keeping the Bedouins and the religious leaders happy, and he fully enjoyed taking part in traditional Bedouin customs. Faisal had no difficulty dealing with the religious sheikhs because nobody could say that Faisal was not a holy man, rather an austere character who rejected big plush bedrooms to sleep on a simple bed. By the 1970s, the economy was on the upswing. The demand for oil had exploded. Everything seemed possible. I mean, it just seemed a cornucopia that, you know, was going to be there forever. In 1974, Faisal directed his oil minister, Sheikh Yamani, to negotiate a 60% ownership of Aramco. Saudis started to run uh, the oil fields. It was this, the great national asset, that Faisal felt that the Saudis should take control of themselves. It jerked Saudi Arabia out of this medieval past and threw them onto the center of the world stage because they were producing so much oil, so much money was coming in that they had to spend this money in order to keep the international economy going. Saudi Arabia seemed an oasis of prosperity and tranquility in the volatile area of the Middle East. In 1967, the six-day Arab-Israeli war broke out. He felt very deeply about Israel very strongly about that. He always insisted he was not anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish, but he was anti-Israel. Again in 1973, fighting erupted. Egypt and Syria attacked Israel. During the hostilities, President Nixon promised Faisal he would be even-handed, but then approved a $2.2 billion military aid package to Israel. Faisal was furious. 
having gotten this message that we're going to be even-handed and two days later saying and we're going to give two billion dollars to the Israelis for military aid was a breach of trust personally I think he took it as a personal breach of trust and reacted accordingly and it was at that point that something in Faisal snapped and he gave way to a very strong feeling that was generated by those around him that the power of oil held by the Arabs should actually be used in this war. On his initiative, Saudi Arabia and the other OPEC nations declared an oil embargo against the United States. It was the only card he had to play. It was the only weapon he had in his arsenal that he thought would make a, an impact on, on America. Now, it did make a big economic impact on America, but it certainly didn't change American policy. In 1975, Faisal was at the height of his popularity throughout the Arab world. Then, on March 25th, he attended his weekly maglis, or public audience, for those petitioning the king for favors. Suddenly, a young man rushed towards him. A gun discharged, and the king slumped forward. Faisal had been assassinated. The assassin, Faisal bin Musaid, was King Faisal's own nephew, seeking revenge for his brother's death. The assassin was the brother of a rather unstable prince who had been involved in demonstrations against the new television stations. Faisal had ordered troops to suppress these demonstrations. They had exceeded their warrant. They had shot a number of the demonstrators, including this young man. I was so... So horrified, I still am, to, to think a man of that caliber, a man of that dream, a man of that uh, desire to make things better, uh, had to reach such a, um, a horrible ending. When Faisal was killed, Saudi Arabia genuinely went into mourning. You know, the man who made sense and finally became king is gone. They knew nothing like him from within the family. They respected him. Only three months before he was killed, Time magazine had named King Faisal Man of the Year. Faisal's murder was the second severe shock to the House of Saud in only a decade. The royal family once again had to decide who should lead this vast and complex country. On March 25, 1975, King Faisal of Saudi Arabia was assassinated. Even as the country mourned his tragic death, the royal family moved quickly to choose the next king. The line of succession usually went to the next eldest son of Ibn Saud. However, Muhammad, the next in line, would be passed over by the royal family because of his drinking and volatile temper. The next eldest son, Khalid, was chosen instead. He was kindly. People felt, and indeed he was, benign. Uh, and he also had a great wisdom. And he had this very important role uh, of dealing with the conservative religious sheikhs. He certainly had the down-home touch. Most Saudis regarded Khalid as a very loving uncle. Khalid was more of a caretaker king, unlike Faisal, who was always busy running a government. Khalid was much more comfortable in the tribal environment. King Khalid preferred the sporting life to governing. King Khalid loved sitting in the desert. He loved his hawks. But as he got older, um, he wasn't so mobile. And so he had um, a sofa put into the back of an um, all-terrain vehicle and would go out hunting in that. The day-to-day -day responsibilities for running the government fell to Khalid's brother, Crown Prince Fahd. Fahd was the executive, the thinker, the modernizer. Khalid represented uh, the more traditional side, the more religious side. But this royal partnership was shaken to its core by major events in 1979. In January, Iran, Saudi Arabia's northern neighbor, was taken over by Shia fundamentalists. The Shah had fled, and Muslim cleric Ayatollah Khomeini now governed a new militant theocracy. 
Khomeini and the Iranians trying to export that revolution and that Saudi Arabia was a really tempting target. The royal family are Sunni Muslims, but there is a sizable Shia minority in the east near the oil fields. After Khomeini's victory, they rose up in protest and were quickly suppressed by 20,000 Saudi National Guards. Then in December of 1979, the royal family faced another ominous threat. The Soviet Union had invaded Afghanistan. King Khalid viewed the Soviet presence as a serious threat to the region. The Soviet Union was seen as godless. It was godless. And therefore, a direct threat, not just to Afghanistan, but to the whole Muslim community. Saudi Arabia would support the Mujahideen, religious fundamentalists fighting the Soviets, including many young Saudi Arabians who went there to fight. It was very successful for the, the Saudis and, and successful for us. The, the, the Soviets were defeated. And uh, all these young Mujahideen, uh, uh, paid and trained uh, by the Saudis and to some degree paid and trained by us, uh, were also victorious. But uh, actions have consequences. But King Khalid would not live to see the Soviets defeated in Afghanistan. He died of a heart attack in 1982. Crown Prince Fahd made a smooth transition into his role as king, having been a ruling partner for years. Very gregarious. He would talk sometimes for um, two or three hours at a stretch. He was a very literate, very astute um, person in terms of his knowledge of the world, in terms of his grasp of the diplomacy at the moment. But one of Fahd's major challenges was facing him right at home. Some of the young Saudis who fought in Afghanistan experienced a difficult transition when they returned home. They now viewed the royal family in a new light. How do you get them back on the farm after they've seen Paris? I hate to describe Kabul as Paris, but you know, uh, uh, how do you reintegrate uh, young warriors when they come back uh, victorious from a war. They looked and they saw instead of a country ruled by shepherd kings uh, uh, living austere Muslim lives, they saw a country that was run by and for the benefit of the royal family and uh, where there was a gap between what the royal family said and what it actually did. While the king and royal princes, now thought to number at least 5,000, still claimed to be devoted followers of the strict Wahhabi sect, their opulent lifestyle seemed a contradiction. When Fahd was crown prince, he lost six million dollars in one night of gambling in Monte Carlo. As king, Forbes magazine estimated his wealth to be about 30 billion dollars. He built several palaces, but his favorite getaway would be an expansive estate in Marbella, Spain, with two yachts moored offshore for partying. But the good life does have a price the king's weight would balloon up into, you know, well over 200 pounds and perhaps a good deal closer to 300 pounds. And then he would go on these crash diets. But pretty soon you'd see him. And even in the flattering, concealing garments that uh, Saudis wore, uh, you could tell that there was a lot of king there beneath these garments. I think it added to the way people saw him as someone who was not as self-disciplined and... Uh, with the same inner checks that uh, someone like uh, Faisal uh, so totally had. Many of the princes live as splendidly as kings. Prince Al-Walid, grandson of Ibn Saud, the founder of Saudi Arabia, is one of the richest men in the world, worth about $20 billion. The prince enjoys showing off his $100 million palace with 17 dining rooms, 12 elevators, a private screening room, Movies are forbidden in Saudi Arabia, and his own stuffed zoo. This flaunting of wealth did not sit well with Saudi fundamentalists who returned from fighting in Afghanistan. They viewed the Saudi dynasty as decadent and corrupt. Fahd's smooth transition to power was turning into a bumpy ride, as threats both internal and external began to plague his reign. You had this uh, population explosion, more and more people who were needing education and, and needing health service and needing housing and needing jobs. And the Saudis just were not 
uh, producing the jobs that they needed in order to keep the uh, population, you know, satisfied. In 1990, the Saudi royal family would confront an even more ominous threat. Saddam Hussein of Iraq invaded Kuwait, a neighbor to Saudi Arabia. King Fahd feared Saudi Arabia might be his next target. In 1990, in a surprise attack, Iraq invaded Kuwait. King Fahd of Saudi Arabia feared his kingdom might be next. The king had enjoyed a close relationship with the U.S., but it would be tested during Operation Desert Storm. Along comes uh, Saddam, scaring the daylights out of the Saudis. This is sort of like their nightmare about the Khomeini, but having uh, gotten a lot closer and gotten a lot bigger and nastier and more threatening. King Fahd gave President Bush permission to station U.S. troops in Saudi Arabia for Operation Desert Storm. But other Saudis weren't happy with that decision. Even taxi drivers tell you we have spent hundreds of billions of dollars buying arms from the United States. Now, we're paying the United States to come here to protect us. We're paying twice. Why is this happening? After Iraq's defeat, 5,000 American soldiers remained behind in Saudi Arabia. Muslim clerics and international terrorist Osama bin Laden would angrily denounce the royal family for allowing these infidels to remain on Muslim soil. Saudis had always had a real fear and resentment of an American military presence in Saudi Arabia for two reasons. One, they are xenophobic and the idea of armed foreigners in the country was very disquieting to them. Another thing that, that was of grave concern to them was that they consider Saudi Arabia to be sacred soil because it is the place where Mecca and Medina are. In November 1995, angry rhetoric turned to violence. A U.S. training mission in Riyadh was bombed, killing five Americans. The following year, another devastating attack. A U.S. military housing complex in Duran. 19 Americans were killed. King Fahd claimed to have found and executed the guilty terrorists. But FBI agents complained that they hadn't been given access to the investigations. There was now a decided chill in relations between the United States and Saudi Arabia. Internally, King Fahd faced other problems. He had anteed up the major tab for Desert Storm, about $55 billion, and the economy was suffering. Yet he chose not to cut back on princely stipends or commissions. Rather than reigning in the royal family, he more or less just let them run wild. I think Fahd really was breaking the commitment to what I might call social justice in Saudi Arabia and allowing the elites to amass great wealth. In 1995, during this period of growing discontent, King Fahd suffered a major stroke. Since then, he hasn't been well enough physically or mentally to run the government. Crown Prince Abdullah has been running the government and will become the next ruler of Saudi Arabia when Fahd dies. Abdullah is the right man at the right time. He has maintained his ties to the, to the traditionalists. He is very well respected by all Saudis as being uh, pious, uncorrupted, and he has really stepped in and began to, you know, cut down on the prerogatives of the royal family. Abdullah is well aware of the challenges facing him at home. And internationally, Saudi policies were being questioned since the revelation that 15 of the 19 terrorists who attacked on 9-11 were Saudi citizens. In 2002, families of those who perished brought a $1 trillion lawsuit against Arab banks, charitable organizations, and three Saudi royal princes, including Prince Sultan, the defense minister,
and Prince Turki al Faisal, ambassador to Britain. The lawsuit charged that they had supported terrorist groups like Al Qaeda, responsible for the attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Although we cannot prove that high ranking Saudi officials committed this atrocity, we know for a certainty that they were the terrorists travel agents who delivered them well fed, well trained, and well equipped to the World Trade Center that day. The lawsuit added to the already strained relations between Saudi Arabia and the United States, and the royal family threatened to take billions of its assets out of America. And unlike 1990, when they had allowed the United States use of its air bases during the war against Iraq, in 2002, Crown Prince Abdullah said no to the U.S. unless the attack was sanctioned by the United Nations. After 70 years of interdependency trading oil for security, it seemed the royal family and the United States had reached a critical turning point. No one could predict the fate of the Saudi family. But since they already had managed an incredible leap from the Middle Ages to the 21st century in only seven decades, many felt they would probably weather this as well. This is a vibrant society. It has its problems like all societies in the world, but it is not a failed society. It is experiencing growing pains, but it is a society that will certainly endure.